Well, good morning, Gospel Hope. For those of you who, who remember Spanish class, buenos dias. Good job. Now I'm going to transition into a full-blown Spanish. It is a joy and a privilege to be here with you guys. My name is Manuel Sanchez, and I'm one of your missionaries sent out to the mission field by Gospel Hope. And uh, I am so excited to be back. We were uh, the first ones that um, God in his mercy uh, used you to display the transforming uh, uh, grace of the gospel into, in the Dominican Republic. And uh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be here with you this morning. Allow me to, for a few minutes, uh, share few uh, thoughts on how the Lord is using um, Grace City Church, Iglesia Ciudad de Gracia, in the DR. And before I do that, I'd like to share briefly my testimony. On the first service, uh, I only had like 20 minutes to do the sermon after my presentation. And I see that now Brady put me there 99 minutes. Uh, so hang in there for 99 minutes. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll turn into a full-blown uh, Latino church here this morning. <laughs> Born and raised in the Dominican Republic, uh, grew up in a single parent home. My mom, Sarah, and my sister, Sarah, as well. And uh, I grew up not having a father figure in my life. And that difficult reality of not having, not having a man guiding you and leading you through life really impacted me and affected me in so many ways that I didn't even know until I got older in life. Later on, the, the Lord used our church in the DR, Iglesia Bautista Cristiana, um, to uh, bless me with men that invested in my life. And throughout my life, even though I didn't have a father figure in my life, the Lord sent a couple of men that just invested, pour into my life, cared for me, loved me, discipled me, uh, I didn't even know that until I graduated. Pay, some of them pay for my schooling at a Christian school in the DR. And I was blessed to have men that model me a Christ-like uh, 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 male uh, leadership. Later on, as uh, I grew up in a Christian home with my mom, I believed, I thought it was a Christian. And it wasn't until I was 16 years old that after hearing the gospel so many times at our Christian school, the Lord convicted me of my sin, and I surrender my life to Jesus. And from that moment on, I had this burden and desire to live for him and to make an impact and, and by his grace and through him uh, bring and call others to repentance and to disciple others the same way I had been discipled and blessed. And uh, I got the opportunity to go on a missions trip to Cuba after I got saved. And in Cuba, there, seeing the persecuted church, uh, the Lord uh, gave me uh, a sense and a conviction that he wanted me to be uh, into uh, a preacher, a full-time ministry. I didn't know what that would look like. And we understand that to be in ministry and be in mission, you don't have to be a full-time minister. We are called to be missionaries and, and live out our beliefs and the gospel in every context that we're in. A work uh, in whatever capacity you are uh, serving and the Lord has you. But the Lord gave me that conviction and that desire to uh, uh, be a minister of the gospel. I went back home, graduated from high school, and uh, the Lord began to open doors. The first one was an opportunity to come to the United States, to Wisconsin. Out of all the places, from DR, 95 degree weather to Cheesehead Land, northern Wisconsin. But there he had a plan. Uh, he, he wanted me to be a, a Packers fan. And, <laughs> and I, I'm thankful for that. After four years there, I met my wife. And that was a plan that the Lord had. Uh, he brought into my life a beautiful um, wife. Her name is uh, Jenna. And we, to make the long story short, we've been married for 13 years. We have four children. And... Uh, it's, uh, it's been a joy to uh, journey together in this season. 
After I graduated from, from school, I moved to uh, Joliet, Illinois, where I served uh, alongside Pastor Ryan there for about three years. We lived in their basement for three years, and uh, we only lasted three years. They kicked us out. Um, they didn't kick us out. We moved to a new ministry serving at a Spanish-speaking church. And during those seven years in Joliet, I had a desire to go back to DR, but didn't know how to. Didn't know how to go about it and didn't feel the Lord calling us uh, yet. And as Gospel Hall was being planted, uh, the pastors here had a, bur a burden and a vision to be a sending church, a missionary church. And uh, Ryan and others from here took a trip to DR and I went alongside them and connected with Pastor Carlos and Pastor Cadel from Cuba. And we began to pray, uh, what would the Lord have us do in, in the Dominican Republic? And, and that's when the doors were opened and the conviction came that it was time for us to move back to, to the island. And uh, we moved in the summer of uh, 2021, sent out by you on a Send Sunday service. It was a beautiful, uh, emotional time. And we've been in Santo Domingo uh, for the last three years planting Grace City Church alongside three other brothers. One of them, you know, Pastor Carlos was here back in February and he was uh, sharing the word with you and, and mobilizing us to, to be on mission. And Pastor Karel, uh, to your left, he is a brother that I got to spend time with in Cuba when the Lord called me to full-time ministry. So all the way from Cuba, now the three of us get to serve together and, uh, and plant uh, Grace City Church. One of the things that I learned from being here in the States is the, the importance of, of being a church that not only thinks about uh, themselves internally, but also thinks about the nations, global, the gospel reaching the nations. And in the DR, we've been blessed by uh, receiving so much from the U.S. and other countries. And one of our burdens as a team, as a church, is that we would now be the senders. We would be now the ones supporting other ministries. And in that effort, we began to pray, how can we train the church to be a given church? And we say, uh, Ciudad de Gracia, we want to be a church that moves from the joy of receiving to the joy of giving as well. And... Uh, Two years ago, we began that by doing a missions offering in December. In December, you get in the DR a 13th salary. So you get an extra salary by law. And so there's an opportunity where people have more resources. What are we going to do with those resources? So we mobilized the church to think about the nations. And the first year, our goal was to raise 200,000 pesos, uh, not dollars, pesos, uh, which is about $4,000. And uh, it's, it's a lot of money for us. And the goal was, we said, it's going to be internal. Uh, our church members and whoever comes and wants to give to support the missionary effort around the globe. And at the end of that two-week period, we raised, uh, we, uh, I'm sorry, the first year it was $2,000. We raised $4,000. And the second year, last year, our goal was 4500 and we raised 6,500 uh, by God's grace. And, and the, the passion and the, the church being mobilized to give and be on mission uh, allowed us to, to be supporting with a, a love offering, significant love offering to about seven partners in different parts of the globe that are serving also the Latino community and also some church planners in the Dominican Republic as well. So, some of these things have been learned and contextualized and transferred to us in the island. And I praise the Lord for the opportunities to be trained by you, sent by you, and your resources, what the Lord uh, puts in your heart to give towards gospel hope is fueling the mission and the gospel in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. We have about 50 kids showing up on Sunday mornings and 120, 120 adults. Uh, this year we had four baptisms so far, and next month we're gonna have two more baptisms. So people are getting saved, the Lord is transforming lives. 
And I say all this humbly, he, he's so kind because he does all of this in spite of us. He knows we, we can't do it ourselves and we don't have the power to do so. So we praise him for his work in the DR. And I'm just a representative here of what God is doing in Santo Domingo and reporting back to you to say thank you on behalf of our church and our pastoral team. Thank you once again, Gospel Hope. With the 80 minutes I have to preach now, <laughs> I would like to continue the series on anthropology that Pastor Ryan has been uh, preaching from. And I would like to uh, turn your attention to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. 1 John 3, 1 to 3. And this is God's word. See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears... He will be like him because we will, be, we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Father, we come before you, uttering these words and this calling of your mercy and help and grace to speak to your church this morning. Not me, per se, but your spirit, your words, penetrating and transforming and convict, convicting and encouraging your flock here this morning. We praise you this morning for the many opportunities we've had, uh, my family here, to be part of this church for a whole year and now being sent by them alongside other pastors and serving in Santo Domingo and serving as an extension of your work here in the island. And as children, we are needy this morning. Needy to hear you speak to us, needy to, uh, for your help to respond to your word this morning. And I pray that, that your word will fall into fertile ground this morning. If anyone here, Lord, is struggling and has this tension, of even being present and hearing your word, I pray that your spirit, your gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, would soften, convict, and also encourage. We need you. You are our Father. So please, can you come alongside us the next few minutes and lead us in spite of my insufficiencies and my shortcomings? In your name we pray. Amen. In the Pilgrim's Progress, it's a work written by John Bunyan, there is a scene where Christian, the main character, reaches the house of a character called the Interpreter. In one of the rooms, Christian sees a picture of a very fierce battle between a man and Apollyon, a powerful demon who represents Satan. Apollyon attacks Christian fiercely, throwing lies and accusations at him, trying to make him feel guilty and unworthy of his journey to the celestial city, which represents heaven. Apollyon says, you have already been unfaithful in your service to him, and how do you think you receive wages from him? Christian responds by acknowledging his failures, but declares his, faithful, his faith in the mercy and forgiveness of his king. Despite the intensity of the battle and the accusations thrown at him by Satan, Christian holds onto his identity as a follower of Christ and ultimately triumphs over Apollyon. Apollyon. And church... Just like Christian here in the Pilgrim's Progress, 
we too face constant attacks from the enemy who tries to guilt us and make us doubt our identity as children of God, don't we? If we are honest with ourselves, we constantly hear these words, this whispering, you're not good enough. Are you going to sit on this fuse after you know what you've done? It is interesting that in the same way that Christian fought back the temptations and the blows from Satan represented here in the story of Pilgrim's Progress, you and I have to come to the realization and understanding that if you are in Christ, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are now a child a daughter of God. And that has tremendous implications. This truth is important for us not only to hear it, but also to embrace it, to make it true in our own hearts. And I would say it this way, we must embrace our identity as children of God, living with hope and holiness in this world. If you're going to live this life and want to be a successful Christian, a Christian that represents well the glory of God in your life, you need to have this truth engraved in your mind and in your heart. If you are a believer, you are now a child of God. We are children of God. But isn't it interesting that even though we know that and we've heard that so many times, We act as if we are orphans, displaced children. And I believe this is what John is doing here in 1 John chapter 3. As he's trying to encourage the church to embrace his calling as children of God. In chapter 1, John is writing to the church, reminding them and confronting them and encouraging them to fight against false teaching. And he calls them to be children of light. And in chapter 2 then, as they are being attacked and confronted with false doctrines, they are doubting their salvation and their faith. And and he says in in John 2, verses 1 and 2, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may, you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So he's trying to encourage the church. If the devil comes to attack you, if those thoughts come to your mind and your heart, you need to remember that you have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ. So he's, he's trying to, to say to the church, be encouraged. And now I want you to be encouraged in this way. Look at the great love, chapter 3, that the Father has given you, gifted you. I like how other translations put it. Look at the great love or, or see what great love the Father has lavished on you. And the word lavished here, it's a, it's a better uh, implication here, the gift of God. What is the gift that he lavished on us? It, 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 communicates the idea of generosity, of abundance. It it is the the prodigal son coming back after wasting all his resources and walking away from the father, he comes back and the father throws a big party. He lavishes his love on his child because he repented from his sins and now he's back again with the father. He's graciously and generously throws a party for him. And John is saying, okay, you're being attacked by these false teachers. You're being, when you're being tempted to uh, feel prey of, from the weight of sin when, when you sin against God. Remember, you have an advocate. But I want to tell you something more. You are a child of God as well. You are children of God. And it's interesting That for us to understand the implications of what it means to be a children of God and how we how we become children of God, we need to remember ourselves the gospel. Yes, it is the gospel that we preach often. Yes, it is the gospel that we're preaching today. Yes, it is the gospel that we need to preach for the rest of our lives until Jesus comes to remind ourselves of who we were before we came to know Jesus. 
or to remind yourself today of who you are if you are not a follower of Jesus yet. You see, there is a human condition that is true of all of us. We are born sinners, all of us. The scripture tells us that the sin of Adam and Eve, our representative before God, transferred all the way in Romans 5 to humanity, to you and me. And the consequences are the righteous judgment, separation from a holy God, physical separation and also spiritual separation. You and I are sinners, brothers. The disposition of our hearts without Christ is to always rebel against him. It is to reject his commands and live to ourselves. The terrible disease of sin cannot be over, overcome by our human means. In fact, the more we try to save ourselves, the more we make, we will sink in disappointment and despair. Have you tried to save yourself from your sins? It doesn't work. It makes it worse. Far be from us to ever think that we deserve this love or that we can earn this love on our own merits. In the words of Jonathan Edwards, you're, you're, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. But God, isn't that wonderful news? But God, knowing who we were, knowing that we weren't at our best and would never be at our best on our own without the righteousness of God, but God lavished his love on us, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. That's you and that's me. You are saved by grace. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from work. So that no one can boast. There it is. The gospel is the ultimate proof that we are loved by God. And the truth, the first truth that we are reminded here in how we are loved by God is that we are deeply loved by God. We are deeply loved by God as we saw in those passages. And how do we know that? The cross. Jesus bore our sins. The cross. Jesus, knowing our past, our present, and our future sins and struggles, he, he willingly goes to the cross and dies for you and for me, but did not stay dead. But on the third day, he rose again as a testimony that everything he said was going to be true. And he gives you that hope and that future by doing this. And this is the best part. Now... He seals you. Now he gives you the privilege to become children of God. Before God, we were strangers wandering in this world. And now through the work of Jesus, through the gospel, we are brought into a family, into a relationship with our Father, with our Creator. And He's not just a distant being out there saving people and being disenchanted with them. No, He wants to personally walk with you. He loves you deeply and He calls you your children. Oh, what a blessing it is to know that. As a young man who grew up without a dad, those words have a deep meaning in my heart. Feeling lonely at times, feeling disoriented and wishing that conversation with dad about what to do in this situation. But in his mercy, 
because he saved me by grace. I was able to utter those words up to heaven and remember and know that yes, I have a father. That yes, I have a loving father who cares for me, who loves me, and who deeply is involved in a relationship with me. Church, because Jesus died on the cross, you and I are now children of God. And that should fuel, that should impact our lives, that should motivate us to live in a way that is honoring to him. But in this relationship, as we become children of God, the Apostle Paul in Romans and also in Galatians uses the word adoption to describe this work of salvation. So there's another way to say we were lost and rescued, but not only rescued, we were given a title. God gives us the title. He signs the property deed, and he says, now you are mine. And then it's a work of adoption. And now I was a stranger. I didn't know how to call God. I didn't know how to talk to God. Now I direct my words to him as my father. You are my father. And this is important for us. This is important for us. Because in the same way as we have graciously been adopted by God, in today's day, the adoption process involves a family that is willingly initiating the process of offering the rights, resources, and name to a child that has not, that has not parents in his life or her life. The desire of the family is not only to save that child from an unfortunate situation, but to give the child their all. And whatever is the parents is in the parents' possession becomes that child's possession. Now, legally, before a judge, they have to sign a document that says, I am legally responsible for the well-being and for the care of that child from now on. Oh, in the same way, you and I have been brought into the family of God, not just as rescued people on the side of the street, but as adopted children of God. And all the rights, all the privileges, all the blessings given to the Son, to Jesus, now have been transferred to you and to me. And even though you grow up in a difficult situation, strenuous situation, whatever it might be, if you are a child of God, all the blessings, all the riches of God have been stored for you because he is your father. What a blessing. What a gift. But there are times that that child that has been rescued that has been adopted, it's going to have doubts. Do I really belong here? And the parents will quickly turn into encouraging mode and, and remind that child, yes, you are ours. Yes, you have my last name. Yes, you have my resources. Yes, and that child began to, to question and that child began to, to wonder if he really fits into that new family that he was brought into. And in the same way you and I struggle, that we have that knowledge in our heads and when a difficulty comes to our lives, then we all of a sudden begin to wonder all of a sudden, we went, begin to question the goodness of our Father. You might be tempted to say, I don't know if I am deeply loved by God, like you are saying here, Pastor Manuel, but I'm here to, to remind you that he did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for you and for me. How will he not give us all things with him? When you feel like that, you need to be reminded the words of Isaiah 43, 1b. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. The Father, in the midst of our agony, loves us deeply. In the midst of the, uh, our, our feeling disoriented, he comes and he says, no, 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 you're mine. Where are you going wandering into the world? Where are you going following other father figures that would never do what I can do? I loved you. I gave my son. And by the way, you are mine and nobody can pluck you out of my hands. 
the Father loves you deeply, you might be feel or feel tempted to think that God has abandoned you in your suffering. Some of you are going through a lot of suffering right now. And the Lord, our gracious Father, says, do not fear. Isaiah 41.10, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you onto you with my righteous hand. God is with you. Even though you don't feel like he's present, he is ever present in your life. For he's a faithful father who loves you deeply. When you feel like you have failed and disappointed God and others, oh, how many of us have been there? How many of us have been there where, where that feeling is crushing when we sin and, and it's noticeable to others and others see it and people look at you and you feel like I've disappointed not only God but others? Who can separate you from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sore? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Through him who loved us, church. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depth nor any other created thing will, able, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. Jesus our Lord. You're, you are not defined by your past failures or your present struggles as a child of God. Your father is merciful and slow to anger. He loves you deeply. He sent his son so that you can get hold of that truth. I am a child of God. And because of it, I'm going to live differently. I'm going to live differently. And my encouragement to you, we need to embrace that truth. We need to live it in our lives. Second truth, not only John teaches us that we are deeply loved by God and in your need, in your difficulty, he's ever present. But also we learned, truth number two, our future transformation is guaranteed. Our future transformation is guaranteed. Verse 2, dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. Well, the Apostle John here tells us something incredible, important about our future as children of God. It is interesting to say that as, as part of God's family, the full extent of what is going to happen with us is going to get better. Even though there are struggles and times and there are times of victory in our lives and we enjoy those seasons where we've conquered sin and we've said not to sin and we live within God's will, obedient lives, and we feel good about it, it's going to get better in the future when we see Jesus face to face. And what John is saying here, there's something that's going to happen to you as a children of God that is not going to happen to other people, and it's that you're going to be completely transformed. Something is going to change in your lives. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new Creation, I can hear you. He's a new creation. The old has passed away and, and see, the new has come. In other words, in one sense, Paul is saying, when you become a Christian, in one sense, you are declared righteous. You are a new creation. The old man is, is in the past, is crucified with Christ, is, 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 is uh, buried, and, and the power of the resurrection already defeated that person, and now I'm a new person. I should be a new person because Christ now lives in me. So I'm transformed. Manuel legally has been transformed by the gospel, but not yet. There's a process in which we are continually growing and being shaped by our Savior. It's like a sculpture 
where, where, where you see that, that, that piece of marvel with, with no n- nothing that you see there precious of, or value, but the, 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 the artist there, he looks at it and in his mind, he sees what it would be when he's done working with it. And, and he begins to chisel away those things and those areas or those, uh, the, the marvel there that doesn't look like his son Jesus yet. And, and he begins to chisel away, chisel away. And then the nose begins to form. And then the ears begin to form. And then the eyes. And it's, it's a long process. In his mind, even when he wasn't done yet, it was a piece of art in his eyes and his mind and his future. But it is being transformed day by day. And what John is saying here, look, the changes that you're seeing right now, are not even close to what it's going to be when you see Jesus face to face. You will see him and be like him in two senses of the word. In the sense that I'm going to have a resurrected body. We're going to be like Jesus is that way. The one who rose again from the dead now has promised me a new body. And I'm going to be with him in a new body. No more aches, no more cancer, no more pain, no more struggles. But also we're going to be perfectly and completely holy before him. And the struggle against sin will be no more. Aren't you tired of fighting against sin? How many times have you just cried out tears of oh, disappointment that you're constantly fighting with that emotion, with that sin that at times in Hebrews 12 he says that besets us sometimes. John is saying, listen. You are children of God, and because you are children of God, there's going to come a moment that that struggle will be no more. You will be totally perfect, like the Son, Jesus Christ, is perfect. I remember growing up and seeing parents and maybe not handling their children the way I would as a teenager. You know where I'm going. And then I say, when I get married, oh, man, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to let him do that. I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. And it was very self-righteous until I got married and I have kids. And when that two-year-old began to, one-year-old began to flesh out his sin, and I began to do the same things other people did, huh, I was like, what um, have I thrown myself into here? And the struggle sometimes in parenting is like that frustration of being tired all the time, of caring for your children, that anger that sometimes fleshes out. And every now and then when that anger and that disappointment comes to my heart, I'm like, Lord, I'm just tired of fighting this anger all the time when my children are not behaving. It might be a sin in your life where you're tired of fighting. And guess what? We're called to keep fighting until the end. It might be a love of money. You just live for money. And it got hold, in, it got hold of your heart. And you, all you do is, is, is money. You don't want to create value to somebody or to a market or anything. You just want money. You just want your bank account full of money. And at the same time, the Lord brings you to church and brings conviction through his spirit. And then you're like, oh, Lord, there's this tension all, all the time in my heart with this thing. John says, listen, we're going to have that tension. But no, when Jesus comes back, all that is going to go away. And we'll get to enjoy him and see him as he is face to face. And there's a third implication that I think is important for us. We already saw that the love of God is is a deep love for us. He loves us deeply. We already saw that our transformation is guaranteed. And thirdly, I want to share with you how truth number three, our hope in Christ leads us to holiness. Look with me, verse 3. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. 
This is very important here for us. Because what he's saying, what hope is he talking about? Well, the hope that Jesus is coming back. The hope that, that the sin struggle will, will be no more eventually, that I'm going to be perfectly victorious for the rest, for the rest, for the rest of the years, for all eternity with Jesus. If you have that hope, he says, those who have that hope purify themselves as he is pure. In other words, they would thrive to be holy people. Those who are children of God do not throw the towel and say, I'm a child of God, I can do whatever I want with my life. Those who are children of God will be very careful what they're watching on Netflix. Those who are children of God will be very careful how they spend their money. Those who are children of God will be very careful uh, what they're doing behind doors. Those who are children of God would seek to use their lives as a testimony of the hope that you are expecting that Jesus is coming back soon. And while he comes, I want to prepare my heart. I want to be ready for it. And church, we live in, in times where so often in our desire to be appealing to the world, we can look like the world too much. And what John is saying here is your life is going to be so radically different. In verse 2 he says that the world would not know you because they don't know the Father. So in one sense, I want to be in the world, but I don't want to be of the world. So in one sense, I do want to have co-workers that are not believers, but I want to show the light of God in my life to those unbelievers and not look like them necessarily. This hope, this reality that you and I are children of God should fuel us, should motivate us, should drive us to live holy lives. Imagine preparing for a special event where you are not, where you are to meet that person that you deeply admire, perhaps a renowned leader or celebrity, knowing you Knowing you well, you begin to prepare extra. You begin to work hard and cleaning the house and cleaning the table and preparing everything, ensuring that you are well-dressed and presentable. The anticipation of this encounter will motivate you to make sure you are at your best. You are ready for the coming of that visitor. In that same way, Knowing that we one day will see Christ and be transformed like to be like him. You and I should motivate our, should be motivated in our lives by the, by the title and by the identity of children of God. To live pure, holy lives in expectation of his second coming. Are you expecting your Savior the same way John is saying here? To the point that it impacts the way you talk, the way you treat your wife, the way you treat your children, the way you work, it's different. Why is it different, gospel hope? Because I am a child of God and I am expecting my Savior to come back. And when he comes back, I want to be ready. Now, some of you might be here this morning saying, you have no idea how much I'm struggling. And I don't feel deeply loved by God. You know what, Manuel? I, 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 don't, I don't have that thrive or that desire to even fight against sin. I'm giving in. I can't do it. I can't do it on my own. And I would say to you, I can't either. None of us can't. Welcome to the club. In one sense, we need the indwelling spirit of God to work in us as we humbly approach him, embracing the good news of the gospel in order to live this way. 
husbands, parents, students. We cannot do this on our own. We need the saving grace of Jesus. We need the enabling power of Jesus. And he already did it on the cross for you and for me. So we run to the cross in times like this. And we beg and we open our arms and we say, Father, here I am. Father, here I am. I messed up. But Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus. But I ask you this question. Can you call him Father? Is he really your Father? The only way that he can become your Father if it's you surrender your life and turn it over to Jesus. To those who believe in his name, he gave him the right to be called children of God. So it might be that you need to come to Jesus this morning. And know him not only as a distant God, but know him as a personal God. And call him Father. Wonderful news for us this morning. May God's word convict, encourage and bless this church. Father, your word has been preached. Mercy has been poured out on us through Jesus. We've been loved deeply. Thank you. And I pray that this truth, the Lord, would also permeate, encourage, lift up many here. To know that in whatever season of life they find themselves in, they can call you Father. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.